Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's session. Uh, we are continuing to study on the book of Psalms. We are continuing from what baby left yesterday. Okay, before we could begin with our class, we will start the class with a word of prayer. Dear God, we thank you, we praise you for this wonderful time that you have blessed us with. Lord, as we set this time aside, Lord, to study your word, to meditate, on the book of Psalms, we pray that, Lord, you will open up our hearts, our mind towards your word, toward the revelation of your word, O oh, Father. We pray that, Lord, as of you put an impression on uh, the psalmist's heart, Lord, to praise you despite the situation, despite what they were going through, O oh, Father. But they had the heart to worship you, to praise you, to give you thanks, Lord. In the middle of the circumstances of Father, Lord, we pray for that. As your Holy Spirit dwells in each one of us, Lord, despite our circumstances, our situation, Lord, help us to be focused on you, set our eyes on you, Father, that we will give you praise, we will honor you throughout our life, O Father. As the psalmist sings, O Father, it is better for me to be in your court than to be anywhere else, O oh Father, or than to be elsewhere. Lord, we pray that you will give us an attitude, a mindset, a heart condition to be like that, to set time to praise you, to love you, to honor you, to glorify your name, Lord. Thank you, Father. We surrender this time and each of us in your hand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much and welcome again to the class. So what did we learn from this book of Psalms till now? What did we understand? Anyone? What did you understand? What was your learning from the book of Psalms till now? Jeffina said, Zeli, go ahead, please. Yes, Sid, you can go ahead. You're there? Hello? One point that you learned from the book of Psalms, from the life of David, Sans talk about uh, the expression of heart. Um, sometimes when the psalmist is rejoicing in the Lord, he pours out his heart. And when he is upset and down, then also he pours out his heart. So uh, it shows us an expression of heart. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much, John. Yes. Brother Lubega. I learned that um, David Rail was a, a full human being with emotions and he was always willing to show them. In other words, he was an extrovert. An extrovert is a person who would like people to understand his inner being through the, his way of life, whereby when he was sad, he would express his sadness. When he was wrong, he would express his wrongness. And when he was hyper or happy, he would always also express his happiness. So I think he was actually the greatest king of the United Israel. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brother Lubeka. Yes, very true. Very true. He, he just showed himself as human. And yes, that uh, even the things that uh, when he sinned, it's been recorded. And how did he react to his sin nature? Mm, how he asked God for repentance. Uh, being a king, he never hid it. But then he brought it out. He brought it a friend of God. He repented. He asked for forgiveness. And we also see God uh, didn't uh, react to David the way he reacted with Saul. He never took away the Holy Spirit. But then when he repented all of his heart, uh, when he was confronted, by the prophet Nathan, 
so beautifully he sings to the lord lord create in me a clean heart psalms 51 uh, you know uh, very beautifully uh, he starts with can we turn to psalms 51 please as brother lobega started on that yeah psalms 51 verse 10 he says create in me a clean heart o god and renew a steadfast spirit within me do not cast me away from your presence that which happened to saul let not happen with me okay but do not take away your holy spirit from me but lord only you can forgive me and restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your righteous and uphold me uh, by your generous spirit then i will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed that which he did to uriah betsheba's wife a husband o god the god of my salvation and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness and then he goes further to say that o lord open my lips and my mouth shall show forth your praise for you do not desire sacrifice or else i will give it you do not delight in burnt offerings because those days they had this practice of offerings you know uh, giving um, uh, an offering for every sin but then psalmist clearly understood god he clearly understood that god is not delighted with the offerings because because everything belongs to him but what does god delights in your heart condition so here he says that you do not delight in the burnt offering the sacrifices of god are a broken spirit a broken and a contrite heart these o oh god you will not despise do good in your good pleasure to zion build the walls of jerusalem then you shall be pleased with the sacrifice of righteousness when he says build the walls of jerusalem um what happens when you build the wall what happens when we build the wall of the city it protects the city there's protection protection from the enemy so what is the psalmist saying uh, in in line of what he is uh, going through he's saying we need to have certain boundaries around us restoration yes we need to set some boundaries some guidelines where god has given to us so when we follow those guidelines we will not fall in for any kind of pleasure any kind of sin so he is asking us to set certain guidelines around us that we may not sin against god we will be protected by god when we follow god's command then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness that means the way we lead our life the way we uh, pray to god he'll be pleased with our heart condition and way we lead our life with burnt offering and the whole burnt offering then they shall offer bulls and you know he talks about the sacrifice and all that so what is important here is it's not about we sinning and then offering sacrifice no uh, he's asking us keep a heart condition right front of god follow the commandments of god what pleases god uh, so that is very important so here we see that psalmist understood the heart of god what is expected from a human and what is not and he um, yes he repented for a sin and asked for forgiveness and we also see the minute when he asked for forgiveness god been merciful god is a covenant keeper god delights in people's praises and prayers and god delighted with david's praise and his praise and god forgave him god yes he had to face the consequence of his sin but then god blessed him god blessed him god rewarded him god's hand was upon him throughout his life and god kept up the promise that he promised david that his descendant will be from the line of david and it was fulfilled in jesus well um, before i could uh, move on with sams i would like to play a video uh, which uh, which uh, uh, portrays like how the poets write it and what kind of meaning what is the background how we need to interpret the uh, poetic form so bear with me as i play that video before we could start with our session Can 
me a minute, quickly I'll play it. Please let me know if it is audible. So we've been learning how to read biblical narrative and showing how the Bible is one. Yes. But 30% of the Bible is made up of ancient poetry. And I don't know about you, but I don't read a lot of stories where one out of three pages is some kind of poetry. Yet poetry is everywhere in the Bible. Some biblical books are entirely poetry. Most of the Hebrew prophets wrote masterful poems. And the majority of God's speech in the Bible is represented as poetry. It's also very common in biblical narrative for the story to pause while a character breaks out in poetic song. Like in the Exodus story, there's a narrative. Poetry has a different purpose in story. Instead of describing the difference, let's just experience it, okay? So one part of the story goes like this. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through on dry land with a wall of water on their right and on their left. That seems pretty clear. Right. Now the poem, telling the same event. O Lord, by the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. Surging waters stood like a wall. Deep waters congealed in the heart of the sea. Whoa, a wall of surging water, like jello and divine nostrils this is intense yeah the poem ignites your imagination through the experience of biblical poets did this with a specific set of tools and that's what we're going to look at the art of biblical poetry the basic unit of any poem is the line and then many lines are designed together to make a poem okay i'm used to this kind of poem there's a meter cadence bum 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 and there's rhyme but Poems in the Bible don't work like this. Yeah, biblical poems are what you could call free verse. They don't use meter like some traditions of poetry do. And they don't use rhyme in the same way either. So biblical poems have no order to them. No, they just have a different kind of order. Bip Finishing one we thought. Right. So, okay. So okay. one part of the story goes like this. By the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. Plunging waters stood like a wall, deep waters congealed in the heart of the sea. Whoa, a wall of surging water, like jello and divine nostrils? This is intense. Yeah, the poem ignites your imagination through the experience of verbal art. And biblical poets did this with a specific set of tools. And that's what we're going to look at, the art of biblical poetry. The basic unit of any poem is the line. And then many lines are designed together to make a poem. Okay, I'm used to this kind of poem. There's a meter, cadence, bum, 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 and there's rhyme. But poems in the Bible don't work like this. Yeah, biblical poems are what you could call free verse. They don't use meter like some traditions of poetry do. And they don't use rhyme in the same way either. So biblical poems have no order to them. No, they just have a different kind of order. Biblical poems are most basically structured by couplets, two short lines that are carefully worded and placed beside each other. The first line makes the basic statement, and then the second line develops it in some way. It can do this by completing the thought, or deepening it with different words or images, or by contrasting it in some way. So check out the opening of Psalm 51. You can see it in action. In the first couplet, the poet asks God to show grace and love. But how exactly? In the second line, he requests forgiveness for his failures. Okay, so this couplet is finishing one we thought. Right. And then the next couplet opens with washing as a metaphor. And then the second line offers a more vivid image, that of a priest in the temple purifying things so they can be in God's presence. Okay, so taking an image and deepening. Right. And then this third couplet opens with the poet's awareness of his sin deep inside. And that's followed by a description of the sin being outside. It's like it's in public, visible to themselves and other people. So this couplet takes an idea and contrasts it. Exactly. So couplets by nature are a bit repetitive. But the repetitive language forces you to slow down and linger over the feeling and meaning of it all, looking at each idea from
from more than one angle. And then groups of couplets can come together around one key idea. It's like a diamond with many facets, each line offering a different glimpse into the same core reality. So this poem is exploring what it's like to be forgiven, offered a second chance. And that's the kind of experience that can change a person. It's worth savoring and pondering. Now, biblical poets also use repetition on a larger scale. In many poems, you'll find a key line that's repeated multiple times. That's called a refrain. Or they'll open and close the poem with a similar couple. That's called an inclusio. Now, so biblical poets love design. Oh, yeah. These are works of verbal artistry. These poets use repetition to create all kinds of elaborate patterns that invite the reader to make connections between different parts of the whole poem that open up even deeper layers of meaning. Cool. So I'm feeling at home with ancient Hebrew poetry. But remember, poetry isn't something you master and then move on. Biblical poems are a bottomless well. They're packed with a surplus of meaning for those who are willing to slow down and ponder them. And just trying to pull my mind in directions and discover new ideas. Exactly. And there's even one more tool that biblical poets have to do that very thing. And that's what we'll look at in the next video. Thank you so much. Let me stop presenting. Okay. I'll just post the link the chat where you all can also listen to it later. Okay. So yesterday we just went through it. So uh, now we understand how the poets actually writes it. And there will be an in-depth meaning in all of these psalms. Give me a minute. Yeah. Yes, literary types. Okay, so uh, in every uh, in, in every poetic writing, when the uh, when the poet writes, there's an in-depth meaning to it. Like yesterday, we saw in the book of Isaiah, and today we also see in Psalms chapter fifty-one. And not only in this chapter, but whereas the complete Psalms has a beautiful in-depth meaning when we read it with the background of their culture, of the writer's background, and we could understand the instances what each one have gone through and how they have related it, how they have portrayed it, we can understand that. So the literary types here we see that there are seven and the first one uh, talks about the wisdom psalms wisdom psalms are the psalms that provides the practical guidelines for godly living and it also gives us a direction for a righteous uh, righteous living according to god's will and we see that in some of the psalms that has uh, that have List, listed there and next we see the royal psalm where it talks about the coming messianic rule of christ jesus as king over heaven and earth and that has been listed uh, portrayed in the listed psalms the third one is lament psalms uh, lament psalms are emotionally charged psalms where uh, the writer records his heart's condition his attitude the situation that he's going through the way he laments he cries out to god for the divine help uh, help and uh, for him to overcome or be delivered from the trouble or pain that he is going through and we see that many psalms have been recorded and even these psalms can be related to our situation in our life today today when we go through difficult situations when we take of um, one of these lament uh, psalm and it will so much apply to our own condition uh, to our own situation or circumstance and where we can raise the psalm as an hallelujah Hallelujah to God, where we can praise God into our situation. Even though situation may be the same, it is not changed. But then we can take this psalm and, um, you know, uh, 
praise God through it and we can see our situation change, our circumstance change. It will never be the same. And even we can see that relief, the change in our heart condition, the change in our mindset when we read and praise God through these Psalms. And the next one we see is imprecatory Psalms where it is motivated by a zeal from God's glory. And uh, these are proactively and uh, proactively invokes God's wrath and judgment upon the psalmist's adversaries, upon the enemies who come against God's children. And we see that uh, in some of the psalms. So when we read it, we get to know like when uh, when, uh, when the psalmist approached God uh, for his help, for him to come and defend the children of God from the enemies who are against them or are uh, raised against them, or they may be much stronger than them. But then when they see God, God sought God for their help, how God delivered them powerfully. God never led them to be the prey to their enemies, even if they were sin, even they didn't met, uh, even if they have not met the standard of God. But then the minute they called on God, God uh, being the Father, uh, being uh, full of compassion and love, He never let His children to become their prey. But then when they seeked God with all their heart and mind, when they repented for their sins, we see God showing Himself as magnificent, showing Himself strong, and defending His children from the enemy enemy's hand and saving them. So the God who did that then is the same God with us now. When we see God in our, in our, time, of, in our time of trial or trouble, and when we repent for our sins and ask God for forgiveness with all our heart and mind, we see God rescuing us. We see God saving us from those deep waters, you know, from that merry clay as how the poet portrays the situation. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> the next fifth point we see is Thanksgiving Psalm. Uh, these Psalms expresses a, a you know a profound awareness of the deep gratitude for God's uh, abundant blessing, where an individual or a nation uh, can come together, uh, be thankful to God in a corporate setup, and how uh, God's blessing will be in abundance. Uh, when we thank God, we also see the blessing that we receive will be in abundance. And we see greater miracles happen when we thank and praise God. There are lists of psalms where the psalmist sings uh, despite his condition. Like one of them that is listed here is Psalms 103, where we all know that is a very famous psalm. Let me take that for you. <clears throat> Yeah. So Psalms 103 is a psalm of David where he says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Forget not all his benefits. Verse 3 says, Who forgives all our iniquities and heals all our diseases. When we come, friend of God, with this kind of heart attitude, if you see the history, if you see the background of this writing, uh, David is not writing this when he was, you know, in peace and rest, enjoying all the luxury as a king in the palace. But then he is writing this when he was running from cave to cave. He was running for his life, though he was a king. He had all the power, but then he was running from Saul. Then later he was running from his own son. And later he was running from the king of the Amalekites and others. But then as he was running, he never forgotten God. One thing uh, he had within him is the hope and trust on God. That never reduced in his, uh, in his life. He knew that God has blessed him. God has a promise. God has a covenant blessing over him. And you knew the power of that blessing that will never go down. He knew God's protection is on him, though he ran for his life. But then he knew within him that God is with him. God's uh, protection is over him, that no enemy can attack him. Nothing will happen to his life. He knew it within him. 
And thus he raises a psalm from his heart saying, Lord, I bless you. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all the benefits, all the benefits. Whatever God did, God treated David as a special son. He was so special, though among his brothers, God chose David. His brothers was much stronger. They were tall, you know, very vibrant and valiant. They were much better than David. His own father never thought that the anointing of king will come on David. But then when Samuel came to his house of Jesse uh, to anoint uh, um, David's father, Jesse, he showed all the other brothers and never even imagined that David would be the person that God has chosen him. Man may look at the outer appearance, but God looks at the heart. Samuel thought, okay, maybe this is the one. This is the one. Each time when he prepared himself to anoint, God spoke with that still small voice within Samuel saying, this is not the one. This is not the one. And when Samuel looked up to Jesse and asked, who's the one that I need to anoint? And here he shows, okay, I have a younger one who's a shepherd. The least of the job that he could do, he's doing it there. And the other children are the army men. They are in the army. They are much strong. They have already prepared. They are fit for the master's use. But then God does not see your outer appearance, not at your uh, the building of your body or the beauty or the structure or how well you're skilled or talented. But then God looks at the heart condition and God was pleased with David. He was a shepherd boy in the field. And here Samuel uh, men asked him to send a word to him. And when he came, God spoke to him, he is the man, he is the king, he is the one after my own heart anoint him. And Samuel anointed him to be the king. And David, after many years, still he says, God, I will not forget all the benefits that you have done for me. I shall not forget the way you saved me, the way you gave Goliath in my hand, the way you won so many battles for me. The people praised Saul 100, but Sam, uh, David 1000. A thousand to ten thousand. How did that praise come? Did actually David fight that battle? No, God fought that battle. Each and every battle, God fought for David. So David never forgot all the benefits that God did and he praises him. And also he says, you are the God who forgives our sins. As a man, he knew his weakness. He knew the areas that... Um, he was displeasing God, but then he brought everything. He never hid it from God because he knew that God sees everything. He brought in front of God all his weakness and he said, God, you are a God of forgiveness. You are the God of forgiveness and you know, and you heal all our sickness and disease, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with the loving kindness and tender mercies who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Amen. Praise God. Isn't that beautiful as how Psalms sing, sang unto God? Today, we can also take up such Psalms, sing unto God, sing praise. It delights him, though it has been written many years, many centuries ago, but then it has been alive. These words have life and they have inner depth of meaning and each time when we read each of us get a different revelation from this word because God speaks to us uh, you know according to our situation in the way we can understand so the sixth is the pilgrimage psalm these uh, uh, festive psalms uh, also celebrates and praise God for Israel and it recalls God's goodness over them as they, uh, you know, as they travel uh, from different places to Jerusalem to celebrate the annual feast of Passover. And uh, next we see the enthronement psalm. Enthronement psalm. 
but even before we could go to the enthronement psalm uh, from the pilgrimage psalm, I would like to turn to Psalms 43. Even that is a very beautiful psalm that we could claim and read for ourselves. Prayer to God in time of trouble. It talks about uh, vindicate me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation and deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man. For you are the God of my strength. Why do you cast me off? Why do I go mourning? Because of the oppression of the enemy. O oh, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your tabernacle. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy. And on the harp I will praise you, O God, my God. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. Despite our situation, let's go to God, the tabernacle. Let's go celebrate the joy that God is bringing. It gives an exceeding joy. So some sings and praises God even when he's preparing to go. And, uh, you know, um, it is an anonymous psalm. When he's preparing uh, all the people to go to the feast of uh, the annual feast at Jerusalem. So there are much more psalms when we read, we will understand how people sang as they prepared themselves for the feast and they headed towards Jerusalem. And next we see enthronement psalm. Uh, these, uh, these are the uh, uh, inspire, inspirational psalm or the majestic psalm describes the majesty of God's sovereignty uh, who rules over all his creation and, uh, and also... Um, provides, uh, is the provider, is the caregiver, is the comforter. And he also sustains everything. He controls everything and uh, everything is made by him. It gives uh, God the enthronement. It, it gives God the sovereign power and glory. So when we read that, we will understand. So yesterday, uh, we also uh, looked at the doxology. The book has been divided in five parts, and each and every five part ends with a doxology. And uh, similar to that, we also see the last five books, that is from 146 to 150. 150, the book concludes with five poems of uh, praise to God. If we can turn to Psalms 146. Okay, Psalm 146, 147, 48, 49, 149, 150, you see continuously from 146 to 150, it starts saying, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Actually, the original uh, translation, it says, it's, uh, uh, you know, it starts saying that praise the God of Israel. And it ends again uh, in our version in NKJV, it says, praise the Lord. But then in the Hebrew version, it ends with a word called hallelujah. In the Hebrew word, it, uh, it starts with praise ya. It, it, it does not even say ya way. Because those days, um, they, they paid a lot of reverence to write the word of God. Even to write G-O-D, they used to leave a space, G space D. They will not write G-O-D. And the scribe, whoever has to write, you know, this word Yahweh, they will not even write Yahweh fully. They used to, uh, it has been spelled as Y A H W. E H, they used to write Y space W. Uh, they, there's an hyphen in between space H, and each time the scribes writes that word, you know, he used to go have bath and come and write that word with so much of reverence. 
they need to be physically clean and spiritually as well. They have to keep themselves pure to write that word. That word carried power. That word carried so much of reverence. So in the Hebrew word, in this five last five uh, chapters of Psalm, they have not written uh, praise Yahweh. They have written just praise Yah, which actually means praise God. And in the end, it says hallelujah, praising God for everything. For everything. And then... Um, Uh, do we know that uh, Psalms has one more chapter? How many of you all know that Psalms has another chapter? 151 Psalms. Many of us knew? No, no ma'am, we don't know about it. It is something new. Okay, great. You know, Psalms has uh, one more chapter, 151. The tradition of the Hebrew Bible and the Christian Bible only contains 150 Psalms that we all know. Besides these 150 Psalms, there is one more additional one in the, uh, in the Syriac Bible. It is included in the Septuagint, the Greek version, and the Ethiopic or Armenian Arabic. They have the script, uh, that script has 151 psalm. Even now, some of the version uh, of the Greek Orthodox Church, they have this 151 included in their psalms. So the Hebrew version of psalms was found in the Dead Scroll much later. Much later, it was found. And, um, you know, uh, all, what does this uh, 151 talks about? So before even we could see what this, uh, this 151 talks about, let, let's uh, read that version, okay? It's been included in the Bible Gateway. I thought I will directly project that. Just give me a minute while I present that. Yeah. I will also send the link so you all can read it directly much later. Can we see it? Yes. Okay, so this is in the Bible Gateway. I'll send this link to you all. So this is 151 Psalm. And this 151 Psalm is divided into two parts. Let's read what this says. It says, a Hallelujah of David, Jesse's son. He writes, I was smallest of my brothers, the youngest of my father's son. He made me shepherd of his flock, ruler over the young. My hands made a flute, my fingers a lyric. Lure. Let me give glory to the Lord. I thought to myself, the mountain cannot witness to God. The hills cannot proclaim him. But the trees have cherished my words, the floats my deed, deeds. Who can proclaim, who can announce who can declare the Lord's deeds? God has seen everything. God has heard everything. God has listened. God sent his prophet to anoint me, Samuel to make me great. My brothers went out to meet him, handsome in form and appearance. Their stature tall, their hair was beautiful, but the Lord God did not choose them. Verse 7, he says, instead he sent and took me from flow, following the flock. God anointed me with holy oil. God made me leader for his people, ruler over the children of his covenant. And then he moves on. This is 51 part B. Okay, So at the beginning of David's part, after the prophet of God anointed him. This is after the anointing of Samuel. I went out to attack the Philistine who cursed me by his idols. But after I uncovered his own sword, 
I cut off his head. So I removed the shame from the Israelites. This is the Hebrew version. We also see the Greek version of the same thing. It's written how, how we have different versions, NKJV, KJV, NIV. Even this has different versions in the Hebrew and Greek. It means the same. But then 151 has two parts. 151A has seven verses and 151B, it actually a continuation. But then it's been uh, part two, which has two verses, talks about uh, is victory over the Philistines or victory over the Goliath. That's amazing, isn't it? Something new. So this uh, 151 is a uh, quite autobiographical. It gives us the details of uh, David's life, like how he made flute for playing or how he made harp. And it also speaks about, um, we see, just give me a minute. Um, uh, he speaks about the selection of God as uh, uh, David, as the new king over Israel and how uh, uh, how he sent Samuel to anoint him and how God bypassed all his brothers, though, though they were very beautiful, strong, uh, handsome. But then God did not look, uh, look at any of the outer nature, but then God looked at the heart and God selected David though he were much small than his brothers or he may not have good talent or experience in the army but then God chose David despite his appearance and you know um, yeah and we see David's victory over the Philistine giant in the next part B. Uh, he talks about God giving him the victory. God fought the battle and he gave him the victory over uh, this Philistine who, who came with his God. But then I went with my God. I had trust on the God of Israel and how uh, God gave him the power to behead him. God killed Goliath and uh, David just drew the sword of Goliath and he cut his head. Now, why did he cut his head and why did uh, 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 David carry the head of Goliath? Why did David carry the head of Goliath? He could have just killed him, uh, killed him at that point. Why, uh, why do you think that uh, David had to cut his head and carry it and go into uh, the city of Jerusalem? Can anyone add to it? Yes, Sid, please go ahead. Ma'am, maybe because of the of that oath which saw with the Saul took, whosoever will defeat the Goliath, I will made him marry my daughter. Because of that, maybe as a proof that so David might have took his head to show that I ha I have been I am the one who did this like that. Of a proof of a symbol of victory. Okay. Okay. Anyone else? Yes. What Sid said is yes. So I'll ask him to get the head. But then what did they do with that head? They actually uh, got the Goliath. The, the tradition says that... Um, some of the scholars have written it, uh, saying that uh, David carried that head and they brought that head and they went in, uh, you know, outside the city, there was a, 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 a mountain. They buried this head on that hill and they named that as, uh, you know, um, I'm not getting the name. Uh, uh, what was Golgotha, ma'am? Yeah, yeah, Golgotha. But there was another name before it could be changed to Golgotha. Um, I'm not getting that name exactly. I'm very sorry about place it. Place of skulls. Yeah, yeah. Place of skull is the exactly. meaning. Okay. So what they did is they carried uh, Goliath's head and they buried it there, there in that mountain. And later, okay, the victory that uh, God gave David over the Philistines by chopping his head and uh, uh, you know, trampling his head down and cutting his head. And then he carried it as a mark, like God gave us the victory over the Philistines, over the enemy. And then he buried the head there. And uh, uh, I, I'm not very sure what exactly was the name at that time. But then later, that mountain was named as Golgotha, place of skull. And that was the same mountain where Jesus was crucified. There was a symbolic connection to it. 
where Jesus was crucified and he trampled over the enemy. He trampled over the enemy. He rose from his death. Okay, so that was the significant that was made from this uh, to the time of Jesus. Jesus uh, trampling his enemy over that. He buries uh, the enemy's head there on the same mountain of Golgotha, which signifies um, that, you know, uh, uh, God uh, had uh, a victory over the enemy. And then uh, there are some reasons why this Psalms 151 was not included in most of the Bible. Uh, one is that Psalms was not part of the traditional Hebrew text. Okay, uh, it was later added in the Judaism, uh, considered as 151 Psalm to be part of the Apocrypha books. And um, so the Septuagint included, that is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, included the script as, uh, from the original Hebrew. They translated and included as 151 Psalms in their uh, script but then because the hebrew is not included uh, that may be one of the reason why the canon uh, the the canon has not included uh, that uh, chapter in our bible the second is it could be uh, even though 151 appears in the Septuagint, the Greek version, uh, uh, the translators um, you know uh, numbered it as not of the mark not of the number, not of the number. That means outside the number. They did not consider Psalm as Psalm 151. Uh, they just numbered it that way. So that's one of the reasons why they have not included this in the book of the canon. Uh, yes, I will just send you the link for this Psalms 151. I'll post it. So you get to read the Hebrew version and also the Greek version of this. I'll we'll go back. So some of the unique features which we uh, uh, just went through yesterday, it is the same. Then some additional features I've added here where we have Psalm was the longest term project. Uh, it, was, it took about 900 uh, to 1000 years in making or compiling uh, uh, this book. Okay, and then we see Psalms is the most quoted Old Testament book in the New Testament. There are about 360 Old Testament quotations or uh, uh, in the New Testament of, uh, of which 112 are from the Psalms. And we see Psalms contains more Messianic prophecies than any of the other Old Testament book. And we will go through it when we're going through the foreshadowing of Christ. And then there are duplicate Psalms. You know, it's so similar. Can one of them take up Psalms 14 and the other Psalms 53? If you can compare the, uh, the verses, the scripts are duplicate. And then Psalms 40, 13 to 7. And the other can take Psalms 70. Again, Psalms 60, verse 5 to 12. And Psalms 108, 6 to 13. You see the same uh, um, scripture been repeated. It's almost has the same words in some cases. Or it, ha it contains the same meaning. We'll take any one. If any of if any uh, any have anyone have taken it, can we just read? Can I read Psalms fourteen? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, the fool has said in his heart, "There is no God." They are corrupt. They have done abom abominable works. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. They have all turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. Have all okay, the okay. We'll stop with that. Uh, the, yeah, just to make sure that it is the same. Can If anyone have to, uh, taken 53, Psalms 53, can I request you all to please read? read uh, uh, like first three chapters so sorry first three verses one two and three
Okay, let me read Psalms uh, 53. Yes, please. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt and their ways are, are vile. There is no one who does good. God looks down from heaven on the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. Everyone has turned away. They have together become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Thank you. Thank you so much. So you see, it's the same. It has been repeated. So uh, if we take time to read the other scriptures, you will also find the same thing. And the next is a number of Psalms are uh, rustic in Hebrew with the first word of each verse or the stanza begins with a successful letter of the Hebrew alphabets. Uh, one such example is Psalms 119. It has a complete Hebrew alphabets throughout, runs throughout the scripture in that. Um, with this, we will move on to the foreshadowing of Christ. which is the last one. Yeah, we see the uh, foreshadowing of Christ, Psalm 2, chapter 1 to 12. It portrays Messiah's triumph and kingdom. And Psalm 16, 8 to 11, it, shows, it talks about the death and the resurrection of Christ. And Psalms 22 shows us the suffering Savior on the cross. And it also presents the prophecies uh, with regards to the crucifixion and all of which were fulfilled perfectly. And then we see the glories of uh, Messiah and his bride are on exhibit in Psalm 45. And then in Psalm 40, uh, 72 and 89 and 110 and 132, it presents the glory and universality of his reign. So when we read through it, we see uh, it talking about the Messiah. Okay, with this, we will conclude the book of Psalms and open to class. If you would like to share your learning or you would like to add uh, anything to it, it would be great for us to hear. So what was our learning or you would like to share something that uh, you learned from this class and it was new? If we have a recap, it's always good. So, Rosalind, what did you learn? You can share one point. Each of you all can take up one point. Ma'am, uh, um, Psalms 151 was something new. I, I'm hearing it for the first time today. So, okay. So don't want to, okay. Yeah, this was something new for me. Okay, I'm sure it is the same with all of us as well. Okay, can I request Rosalind to end this class with a word of prayer where we can be dismissed? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Wonderful Father, we thank you, Lord. We praise you for today's class. Lord, we want to bless your name. We give you glory. Father God, you've been teaching us, Lord, through your word. Father God, we believe that you got every word that we hear, we learn, we study is an enlightenment to our spirit, to our understanding. Lord, we just want to pray, Father God, that whatever we learn and we study may be used for your glory. Lord, we want to live for your glory, Father God, through our lives. Father God, we want to bless your name. We want to bring glory to your name. God, we thank you and we bless you for all the precious students that that are in this class. We bless each. Uh, I, I pray, Lord, that you bless each and every one of us, Father God. May we be used uh, for your glory in your kingdom. Lord, I also pray for Pastor Nancy. Bless her, Daddy God. Bless her family. Bless her, Lord, as she's been a blessing in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, Lord, I pray, Lord, through our lives, may you be glorified in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you. God bless you. Have a blessed day. See you all tomorrow. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. God bless. Thank you.